Hello and welcome. My name is Alana Gordon. I'm a reporter at The World covering global health. This is a Facebook Live Q&A about the coronavirus pandemic and will people accept a COVID-19 vaccine? With me is Howard Koh, Harvey V. Feinberg Professor of the Practice of Public Health Leadership at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Harvard Kennedy School. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Alana. So you can post your questions for us on Facebook at Forum HSPH, or you can email them to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. And this Q&A is jointly presented by Harvard School of Public Health, TH Chan School of Public Health, and the world from PRX and GBH. We are doing this on Zoom through Facebook. Thank you for your patience. So to begin, about 180 vaccines against COVID-19 are now in development around the world. Dozens are already in human trials. And a big driving question is, if and when there's an effective vaccine, will enough people want to actually take it? And more recently, these numbers have dropped a lot. A Harris poll found that about 80% of Americans are worried the vaccine approval process is being driven more by politics than science. Another Axios Ipsos poll found the fraction of Americans who say they do not want to take a COVID-19 vaccine as soon as it's available, it's risen, it's risen to 60%. So vaccine hesitancy is a familiar problem, but the level of distrust is something new. And it's especially strong in Black and Latino communities. And these are communities we know are also disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Um, I want to get to all of this in setting up our more broad Facebook Live discussion. But Howard, I have to begin, the last time we spoke early on was about the role of public health leadership during a pandemic. Um, you were a lead during the H1N1 pandemic. Um, and we woke up to news today that our top leader, the President of the United States, tested positive for, positive for coronavirus. And I'm wondering how that fits into all of this dynamics and challenges we're facing right now. So Alana, thanks so much for having me. And this is yet another extraordinary day in this pandemic response. So, so these new diagnoses for the president and first lady uh, represent, of course, serious threats to their health. Uh, we're particularly concerned, for example, that the president is in his 70s and has some comorbid conditions that make his risk even higher. So it's appropriate that care and isolation has started immediately from his medical team. Uh, in the meantime, we're watching aggressive contact tracing efforts start involving the highest members of his administration in the White House. Uh, that's going to lead to more testing and tracing and isolation and quarantine. So uh, Alana, on a day like this, uh, we need to emphasize the importance of science and prevention and public health more than ever before. And that leads us to the topic that you have raised uh, with me to open up. We have gone through so much in this opening nine months and counting since uh, SARS-CoV-2 hit this country, and we have made not enough progress. And now we're in a fall season where uh, flu is coming on. Uh, we are concerned that COVID may get worse. And then there's been tremendous efforts to develop a COVID-19 vaccine under the name of Operation Warp Speed. We can talk about what that implies for people, good and bad, as we continue to chat. But the concern is, as you pointed out, that because of so many developments in recent months, people are concerned that the vaccine approval process is not at the highest scientific level. And so um, there's rising distrust and lack of confidence in the government. And in my old department, Health and Human Services, it really makes me sad to say that because I, I worked there for over five years as assistant secretary. I know so many of the career colleagues there. CDC and FDA in particular are two outstanding agencies that are respected worldwide. So we need to get this right. Uh, we need a safe and effective vaccine approved sooner rather than later and have enough trust and confidence so that everybody wants to take it and we can put this pandemic behind us. So, so those are some of the issues we're going to try to discuss over the next 25 minutes or so. Can you walk me through um, why Americans are so skeptical that um, a vaccine will be safe and effective? Because 
Um, you know, I've heard from vaccine developers and scientists themselves, you know, there are good reasons to be hesitant right now or what's the evidence as we speak. And then there's also general distrust. There's a lot, there's a whole range of um, factors playing into it, but what is it that stands out to you about why in this particular moment we're seeing such a huge drop in the last even few weeks? So if you take a step back and look at the life-saving potential of vaccines, it's quite a public health advance. You had former Dean Bloom on this interview several weeks ago. He's one of the world's experts and somebody I've learned a lot from. But when you take a broad view, Dozens of vaccines have been developed and approved and disseminated to save millions of lives worldwide over many decades. But that's a really time consuming process. You have to be really careful about developing candidates, putting them through phase one, two, three trials, making sure they're not just effective, but safe. The safety themes are hugely important. And then as Dean Bloom has said, uh, the most important ingredient in vaccines is trust because if vaccines are available and no one wants to take them, uh, then these preventable infections and illnesses keep going on. So Alana, I've been involved in many vaccination efforts as both a state public health commissioner and as assistant secretary. I've worked for a democratic president and multiple re Republican governors. I never considered that life-saving vaccination would ever be a partisan issue. But in recent months, we have seen agencies like FDA and CDC be uh, undermined uh, or asked to change guidance and then change it back. It's led to much mixed messaging. And then with Operation Warp Speed, the administration has really emphasized the speed and that's very, very important, but there's all different timelines and projections about when a vaccine could be approved and made available. And then uh, there is also great concern that corners may be cut with respect to safety and we cannot accept that. So more than anything, uh, we need the standard vaccine approval process where there's lots of input from outside expert committees, uh, data and safety monitoring boards, making the whole process transparent and making sure most importantly of all, Alana, that the communication is led by top scientists like Dr. Fauci, who I ha I've had the great honor of working closely with. Uh, we need that communication and trust and credibility to be at the absolute highest level. Are you, are you seeing that scientists and regulators now are being forced to make compromises uh, in order to make this kind of speed? So again, it makes me very sad to say this, but we're seeing so many examples of where CDC has put out guidance and then changed it or retracted it. Uh, the FDA, when they made some announcements on convalescent plasma transfusions um, as a treatment for COVID, for example, uh, that was met with great criticism because people felt that was not an authorization based on the best science and data and trials. And so over time, you add that up and people start saying, okay, is this a scientific process that is following the lead and the, and the guidelines that are established over past years for any vaccine candidate, or is it being accelerated and changed because of partisan reasons? And so that's led to some of the poll results that you just quoted here, Alana, and that is deeply concerning. So we got to get First and foremost, the COVID vaccination approval process, right? We have multiple candidates in phase three trials, not only here, but around the world. Uh, we have to make sure that that's done at the highest and most rigorous level, level with respect to science and transparency. Are you seeing comp similar um, trends? And it may, may not be in your scope or available, but outside of the United States, because we have trials happening around the globe um, being sped up at different rates in different places, um, at different levels of what we know. But how does, how does what's happening in the United States, are, are you able, do you have any insight into that? That's a great question. So this is a global pandemic, not just a US pandemic. And if we're gonna put this behind us, we have to do this together as a global community. There are trials going on in places like Russia and China, for example, where those, vaccine candidates have clearly been 
put forward and now administer it to many members of their countries uh, without the proper safeguards. So that's raising concern. And since you mentioned the global perspective, Alana, there's a very important effort called COVAX, which involves over 150 countries now, also the World Health Organization and uh, CEPI, a Coalition for Emergency Prepared Preparedness Innovation, trying to make sure that when a COVID vaccine is approved, that billions of doses can go to uh, mostly underserved low-income countries around the world. Uh, we have to be part of that, Alana, because if we don't have a global perspective and just take, try to take care of COVID here in our country, uh, it's just gonna invite recurrence over and over again. And that's just gonna be very short-sighted. Uh, you know, the president a number of months ago announced he wanted to withdraw from the World Health Organization and that was met with great dismay uh, we have to see what will happen with the election. Uh, and if there is a new president, uh, I know Vice President Biden has already pledged that he would not want to withdraw. So th these are some of the themes that are before our global public health community right now. A lot of, um, we're there, I want to get to a lot of questions that are coming in from online as well. And you can post your questions for Howard Co. here. But just two kind of baseline things to understand. Um, how do you make sense of what does it mean for a vaccine to be effective? How should the public understand that? Because um, I might think that a vaccine, if approved, that means that I am good. I am completely protected from COVID-19. Um, what does it mean for it to be effective? And what would it mean to be effective in responding to the pandemic? How many people or what percentage would you want to get at and have people um, vaccinated? Okay, those are very important questions. So no vaccine is 100% effective. Uh, we have some vaccines like the measles vaccine that are perhaps 95% effective. So that's tremendous. Uh, everyone knows the flu vaccine that is created anew every year can have tremendous range in terms of efficacy. Uh, last year it was, I think, on the order of 40% or so. Uh, and so someone, some might say that's 40%. too low. Yeah, mm -hmm. some might say that's too low, but the Important question, is it, is it better to take it or not to take it? And even at 40%, it's, it's better to take it. Uh, so for a COVID vaccine, FDA has already put out a standard of at least 50% efficacy, hopefully much more. And we'll never, we won't know, um, Alana, until these phase three trials are completed. We have multiple candidates from Johnson & Johnson and Moderna and AstraZeneca and Pfizer. So we have to see when it's all done, uh, what the efficacy profile looks like and very importantly, what the safety profile looks like, and then communicate it to the public, saying this is potentially life-saving, please take this, because this is what public health and prevention is all about. And it could give us the best shot, literally, to get us back to normal. Um, and then how, how many, what percentage of the community or population would it take to um, be vaccinated? So we're all hearing about this public health uh, term of herd immunity, and that, that means trying to improve levels of immunity in a population so you can protect those who are not immune. Uh, the general consensus is that we need about 70% of the population to be immune, and roughly only about 10% have, have now experienced COVID and potentially have immunity. So that gap is big as you can see, and that means the vac vaccination rates need to be high. Uh, I, I do wanna stress that we are already in seasonal flu uh, months right now. And I think it's really important to rebuild confidence and trust to make sure that our ongoing seasonal flu vaccination efforts are a big success. Last year, only 45% of American adults received the flu vaccine. This year, we got a talk about prevention now with respect to flu vaccination, make that a big public health success and make that be an on-ramp activity for a COVID vaccine that hopefully will come soon. So um, when you were just mentioning, um, you know, it would, you know, we've, researchers often put this kind of 70% sort of thing of, for something like coronavirus. Um, Here's a question from online. In June, um, researchers at the University of Miami found that 42% of Black people agreed that the coronavirus is being used to force a dangerous and unnecessary vaccine on Americans, and that's nearly twice the number for white respondents. 
And for sound historical reasons, many Black Americans and other people of color have not trusted drug companies and medical authorities. There's a cruel irony because minority populations are being hit hardest by the coronavirus. So what can be done to establish confidence in a vaccine in Black communities? I've also been reading how the National Medical Association, a, um, a Black Doctors Association, has set up their own kind of review process. But what's, what, is, what can be done to improve confidence? So what a hugely important question uh, that is. So let me just start big picture by emphasizing that we are becoming a, a more and more diverse nation by the day. I am particularly aware of this as a Asian American and, and as a son of a proud immigrant family. And we know that COVID has just absolutely devastated communities of color. And that's not a surprise to anybody watching this uh, who uh, knows how important health equity is. So in that context, we, we need, again, vaccination acceptance to be at the highest level uh, for all populations. And traditionally, minority populations uh, have had lower vaccination rates uh, exactly for the reason that questioner uh, posed. Uh, there are lots of trust issues. So we, we got to overcome that. This is why vaccination efforts are not just for health professionals. It's very important to involve all community leaders in business and in education and faith-based organizations particularly, uh, I believe can play a huge role. If leaders through society from all different communities say, this is really important for prevention and health and for getting back to normal, uh, we can build momentum and raise trust and confidence going forward. So, how did you find, what were some of the lessons that you learned during H1N1 pandemic when it comes to this and building trust? And also, you know, what you had was a new vaccine in development, you had to distribute it. Obviously this is based on a flu influenza virus versus a new coronavirus, but what are some of the key lessons you learned from that both in distributing, but also in communicating and, and keeping that trust? Thanks, Lana. Another great question. So I think back to when I started as Assistant Secretary for Health at HHS in June 2009. And from the day I started, I joined literally every member of government who was worried uh, and concerned that H1N1 flu was about to hit the United States that fall. And so we spent that summer working feverishly to get ready for H1N1. And sure enough, it came. Now, we were much more fortunate back then because we had a potential vaccine in the pipeline, so it got authorized and then uh, disseminated. And as always, with a new vaccination campaign of any kind, the supply did not meet the demand in the opening couple of weeks and a couple of months, so those were not easy times. Uh, by the way, I must say, uh, I have just great respect for anybody in public health right now at the federal, state, and local level, because th these are tough efforts to coordinate. So those opening months were, were difficult until finally we had enough supply to meet demand. Uh, when it was all over, I think it was about 12,000 people who, who died from H1N1, and that was very difficult to accept. Uh, but what I do remember, Alana, is that from the first day, it was a one government approach, federal, state, local, everybody was involved. And we also very importantly had regular communications to the public led by top public health officials. Dr. Fauci, this, this is 2009, 2010, was one of those leaders uh, even back then. Uh, that's what we need now. And one of the challenges of the pandemic response is we have not had that. We've had 50 states going in 50 different directions and communications that have been inconsistent. And that has led to some of the challenges that we're facing today. This question comes from OEC Yao, um, does the vaccine address transmission? Um, and if it's not completely, then how do we make sure the public health measures to reduce transmission aren't undermined further with all the focus on a vaccine or after a vaccine becomes available? Yeah, so I think what the questioner is asking is, do we need to give up on the other public health interventions that we have adopted for many months? And the answer is absolutely not. I mean, we need all the public health interventions going strong going forward until we can get this pandemic behind us. So that starts with masks. Uh, we have needed a national mask requirement for, for months now, and we still only have that requirement in some 35 states or so. 
So we have to keep the universal masking uh, as part of the public health norm for now and into vaccination and beyond. Uh, we have to keep following the social distancing and the hand hygiene measures. So public health really means keeping all those preventive interventions going forward. Uh, I'm hoping that if we have a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine and people accept that at high levels and then we can reach high levels of herd immunity, at some point we can drop back on some of those interventions, but now is not the time. We need all of it and we gotta double down on it. This question's from Lexi Cohen. Um, what would be the ultimate consequence of a failed COVID vaccine? What would that look like? And has that ever happened to the American population? Boy, Alana, and this is why it's so important to have this conversation. I mean, here is the nightmare scenario that we have a safe and highly effective COVID-19 vaccine, it goes through uh, FDA authorization or formal approval. All the scientists believe uh, that this is um, absolutely effective and without a doubt. And then because this trust is so high and lack of confidence is so high, no one wants to take it. And that is just not gonna be acceptable. And if that's the case, this pandemic is gonna go on indefinitely. So, um, I actually have an op-ed coming out uh, in the next several days. And um, in that, I mentioned not only the need to make sure the approval process for a COVID vaccine is at the highest level, we've talked about that. Also to stress that we need to make the seasonal flu vaccination efforts right now a big success to show people that we have a strong system of prevention. But then we also need to communicate both of those together every day. Uh, there are gonna be some challenges with COVID vaccine. For example, some of them may require two doses uh, particularly the mRNA based ones. Uh, there are some storage issues where uh, they may need uh, sub zero temperatures to be uh, kept viable, for example. Uh, and then uh, we're going to need a lot of communication from health experts about um, trying to distinguish between flu and COVID, or uh, which may be very, very hard, but more important of all, the need for prevention through all of that. And then uh, we've mentioned the, the importance of the global perspective. And then finally, we also have to make sure that our information is high quality. We're seeing lots of challenges with vaccine hesitancy from social media, and uh, we have to start calling out the misinformation and making sure that that doesn't go forward and confuse people and lower acceptance rates. I mean, we saw, for example, a few weeks ago, AstraZeneca paused its vaccine. We learned that Moderna had earlier when something came up um, with to explore um, a complication um, that a patient participant in trials uh, experienced. And so um, how do you communicate with when events like that happen, that um, it's part of the process to ensure safety, but different vaccines may or may not um, prove to be um, it's a messy process. So how do you communicate or build confidence around these parts of the process as well? That's a great question. So that was one person, uh, a woman in Britain, who developed an, an unusual um, neurologic condition called transverse myelitis. So we have seen some side effects like this uh, in other vaccine trials. So the big question is, how often does it happen? Is it absolutely caused by the vaccine candidate that was administered or not? Uh, what is the overall risk benefit ratio? So those are the big questions that are surrounding that trial. It's interesting you mentioned that, um, Alana, because the UK has decided to restart that trial, but here in the US, the FDA is still looking at, at those outcomes and has not restarted that trial here in this country. So that's one evidence in my view of showing extra caution, which I think is absolutely indicated because when we finally do have an authorized or approved vaccine, it, it's got to be at the highest quality level, as we've mentioned before. And by the way, when I was assistant secretary, uh, we spent a lot of time tracking side effects and outcomes, uh, even after approval and distribution. Uh, and we had actually a new uh, surveillance system added on to existing ones. Hmm. Uh, and so I was uh, honored to track that and then help communicate that to leaders within government and to the public because more than anything, people want to hear that it's safe. And if, if they are not assured of that, they're not going to take it. So that's 
worthy of a lot of attention now and going forward. So what you're saying is that a surveillance system like that has been um, developed in part from these past, even though it's a different kind of pandemic, but for example, from H1N1 and those sorts of surveillance systems can also be, um, be even assuring safety and, and checks post vaccine approval. Absolutely right. Yeah. And so, you know, the uh, phase three trials that are out going on, they have 30,000, 44,000, 60,000 participants. Uh, but then it's very, very important to keep tracking outcomes when it, uh, it's administered to millions or tens of millions of people and then have that data in science. So that's what we did at the department when I was there. That's what leaders at CDC have traditionally done. And having that data available for expert advisory committees, for data and safety monitoring boards, for scientific research to analyze and publish. This is how public health gets built up over time and saves lives in the future. In thinking about, I want to circle back around to um, the question that someone online had asked about um, mistrust, for example, in Black communities and how, um, how to um, better communicate how there is some real um, history um, that plays into this. Um, what are, in terms of building trust, how does that play into the vaccine development, but also then the distribution components to ensure that there is the kind of messaging and the kind of availability? What did you learn from H1N1 and how, how do you see that needing to be stepped up now? So uh, this remains the essential question, and I got to defer to great colleagues like uh, Professor Bob Blendon, who has studied trust levels uh, for various health threats, particularly uh, infectious disease threats and vaccines. So Bob's studies and others have shown that the most trusted people in times like this are health experts, uh, and then also one's own doctor or health professional. So we have to really respect the commitment of frontline physicians and nurses who spend a lot of time talking about the importance of vaccination to uh, parents or to adults. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, we, we need community leaders, faith-based leaders, business leaders, school leaders to also send the message and uh, lead by example. Uh, I remember often uh, when I was uh, in my previous roles, Alana, I would get a shot on camera <laughs> at a press conference um, and then make a comment and statement. That, that became part of my job as a public health professional. Uh, that's what makes public health uh, communication so critically important, especially at a time like this. I wanna get to one final online question. This time is zoomed by. Um, this is from Jim and I wanna add on to it. So how big of a factor is obesity in deciding which Americans should get the vaccine first? Um, get the vaccine at first, and I wanted to add on to that age. Okay, that was a great question. So, as I mentioned earlier, every time there's a new vaccine, uh, there are issues of how much supply will be available, uh, at least at the beginning, to meet demand. And the National Academy of Medicine put out some draft criteria. In fact, today they're putting out, I think, final criteria, and they're proposing that any COVID vaccination uh, proceed with four phases. The first priority group would probably involve healthcare workers or essential workers, and then particularly older people uh, with comorbid conditions, as, as you alluded to. Now, you can imagine exactly who is in each of those four groups through those four phases can be a matter of debate. But the issue is, can we have maximum public health impact do it in what is considered an equitable way, and then make sure that with each phase, we have enough supply to meet demand. So that's where you need the outside experts to be involved. And I know groups like the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices for CDC, National Academy of Medicine, and other groups are weighing into that question right now. Finally, just one more, uh, just to wrap up, because we've got about half a minute left. Um, <laughs> you have an op-ed coming out, and I wanted to ask you, um, it has to do in the Boston Globe, it has to do with, um, you know, with these dropping confidence levels in a vaccine for coronavirus, what are the, again, the key things that you see as um, being needed to turn that around? So I've mentioned all the themes, so let me quickly summarize. We, we need the highest quality 
COVID vaccine process that's based on the best science possible. Uh, we need then also, while we're anticipating that, to make the ongoing seasonal flu vaccination effort right now a major success. Uh, last year, only 45% of American adults uh, received a flu vaccination. Uh, we, if we got that number much higher this fall, uh, it would give us a lot of momentum going into a COVID vaccination effort. The communication for both of those is very important because the American people need to see that there's a system protecting them. That's what public health is all about. Uh, we have to uh, address the issues with respect to social media misinformation, and then we need to take a global overview. So Alana, if we can focus on those themes for the next number of months and restore trust and confidence, uh, that's what we need in my view to make sure that people accept the safe and effective vaccine once it's approved and try to put this pandemic behind us once and for all. Well, Howard, thank you so much for fielding everyone's questions. Uh, I think that's a good place to conclude our Facebook discussion. Thank you so much, Alana. It's a pleasure. Can I say one last thing? Oh, sure. So this is all about prevention, which is a passion for me and for all of us. And I often like to point out when prevention works, in this case a vaccination, but all of public health really, when prevention works, absolutely nothing happens. And all you have is the miracle of a perfectly healthy, normal day. And that's what we're all looking for in the midst of this terrible crisis. So I'm hoping that with issues like va vaccine acceptance and other prevention measures, uh, we can make the country and the world healthier going forward. That's a nice thing to imagine. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, this Q&A has been jointly presented by the forum at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the World from PRX and GBH. You can view the full discussion on our Facebook pages and send feedback at Forum HSPH and at PRI The World. Thanks so much.